Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, very proud to be a, a part of this city. Um, we see ourselves to be a small part, but hopefully a catalyst for community. And that's our, that's our number one focus. So um, I've got kind of a, a favor to ask of someone in the room. If there's someone who uh, reads well and dramatically that I could borrow. <laughs> With this room full of creative folks, I'm sure I could get one volunteer for that job. Anyone? Who's doing it? Charmin, boom. <laughs> I love how the volunteer out of need finds the other volunteer. Yeah. So I was just hoping you could, these aren't actually my notes. This is a, a contribution from a guest that I feel like um, I'll read. We'll talk more after. Yeah. Okay, short rib hash. How I long for days gone past when pools served their short rib hash. <laughs> Potatoes, eggs, and mustard gravy, and slow cooked beef. Oh, baby. <laughs> I can do this. Thank you. Yeah, I know, you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Why would this dish just disappear? I think now it's been almost a year. All those ingredients are in the kitchen. But togetherness is what we're missing. <laughs> I've begun to worry about the fate of this continued missing plate, like Kala. Hala. 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 Has it <laughs> has it been your last hour? <laughs> were you all were you also traded for something sour? <laughs> <laughs> so so to the menu planner I plead, bring back that hash just for me. That's Robbie Taylor. <laughs> P.S. I'd also like to take this time to suggest naming a sandwich the Robbie at the Wilmore Redo. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's funny, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but what's great about it is that someone sat at the bar, this is our paper that we make our notes on in the kitchen, uh, little post-its, series of post-its in my life, by the way. Um, so he borrowed our paper after being disappointed week after week for his favorite dish not being there. So, but what, what, the, what it's about is not about this delicious dish or the fact that it's missing. It's about the fact that someone who loves this thing that we do feels ownership. If not physically over what we're doing, he feels it emotionally. And through that, we create community and we create a following and we create something where we get to exchange something and we get to be together. And that's the thing that is why the company that we run is successful because that's our favorite part. And <clears throat> I think um, for pools, as you guys, I think a lot of you are very familiar, and I, I know a lot of you have experienced pools, if not some of our other places, but it was uh, a really interesting project for me, of course, my first ownership role, and one that I felt quite ready for. Um, I don't think you're ever ready. I think you just go out there and do it and figure it out along the way because we certainly had some scary moments in, in the early days. But um, I walked into this, this place that was so special to this city. It's the third oldest restaurant in downtown Raleigh. The folks who own the building, uh, my landlord's in her late 70s. She's the daughter of John Poole. So a few things were very important, preserving uh, sort of the ghost of that space um, and keep, you know, keeping the name and really paying tribute and, and honoring it through um, not doing the exact same thing that it had always done, but keeping this spirit of this kind of every man's place alive. And that was something that, uh, it was our, our first time out there, and all that we knew was how we wanted to make people feel. And I can honestly say to this day that we feel tremendously successful in that department. And uh, so the idea of like the chalkboard menus, we get a lot of, um, have had a lot of criticism in the past for this. But the thing that not everybody gets to see that we get to see uh, is when people walk into that restaurant and they're new, they're often, before we could identify them, they're often identified by a regular 
by the way that they're looking at, at the chalkboards, which is a really amazing thing. And when we talk about that ownership and concept and that ownership of places in our community that make us feel special and make us feel like a part of something, it's not just business, it's community. And, and that was the goal and that's what, uh, that's what we've achieved. And, and I think that, you know, and, and that we continue to work towards is a always moving goal. So um, I think that, you know, with those boards watching, it's the most heartwarming thing in the world to me. And it says so much about the, the comfort and confidence of this community to watch somebody walk up and say, and it happens constantly and it blows my mind, is this your first time here? And the person turns around and says, oh yes, I'm sorry, do you work here? No, 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 but here's what you have to have. <laughs> make, sh make, sure that you don't, make sure you don't miss this. So that's uh, kind of where, where I started and I'm gonna show you a really, as Matt mentioned, really random selection of where we've gone and how we've gotten there. And I don't think there has been a lot of um, organization <laughs> to it, oddly enough. Uh, and, and you know, for me, I, you know, I think it came out recently in, article, in an article that I was a proud C student. And, <laughs> and um, it's an interesting thing to say, but it's true because what uh, I'm uh, diagnosed as uh, what my therapist calls highly functioning, maybe too highly functioning ADD. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a, um, a prescription for that. Each one is 30 pills. The bottle is dated August 12th from last year and I have two left. And when I have a pile of things in front of me that I have to, and I, and I don't have time to read it all out loud to myself, that's when, I, that's when I indulge in that. But otherwise, I find some kind of great energy in that inability to focus on one thing. I view it as a beauty and focusing on multiple things. So um, this slideshow is going to be uh, I wanted to just share something with you that is the way that I think about most of my days and I encounter um, textures and images and experiences that just make me feel a certain way and remind me of you know, stories and make me hopeful for things in the future and uh, just make me aware and, and a little bit sharper and focused in those places that are kind of broad for me. So, um, you know what, we're gonna come back to him. We'll come back to him. <laughs> This is, uh, that's me laughing my ass off, a few, few glasses deep. That's John Currents in the middle. Um, this, this, uh, this represents a few things, and, and I'm going to talk about why, why they're important to me. So that's John Currents in the middle. John Currents uh, kind of owns the restaurant scene in Oxford, Mississippi. And he uh, has been best chef, James Beard best chef in the South a handful of years ago. Um, and to me, he's uh, a great friend and the father of my newly born goddaughter. Uh, on, on the right is Vivian Howard, who I am delighted to bring up today because she's very important to this state. She is uh, uh, from Deep Run, North Carolina, and she is, uh, has a place called The Chef and the Farmer. And it's incredible. And what she's doing that's so worth talking about in food and important that you make the time to go be a part of is she's recognizing her roots She's worked in all these great restaurants in New York City, and she's gone home to connect her farmers with you, which can be difficult from you know, nearly three hours away. So she's in Kinston, committed and dedicated to doing this beautiful project and uh, feeding the people who live in her community and giving people a reason to visit her community, which I think is inspiring on a, a lot of levels for all of us. Uh, the reason that we're sitting here together is because we've just completed a dinner that was uh, a fundraiser for the Frankie Lemon Foundation, which is, as mentioned, I am, I am a board member. Um, and like most things that I do, I don't sit on a board, I actively serve on a board. And so this is a, a, a time where I've asked my friends to come from their busy lives and, and come to an event and, and cook with me. And this is one of, one of the earlier times I had the chance to do that. And, Every time it completely touches me and blows me away how much we have the ability to do when we come together and we bring multiple communities together to respect each other's community and ultimately we end up with this, this reach and ability to teach each other so much from, from different communities. Um, this is a shot of another very important thing, hopscotch. Very important piece of Raleigh. 
I'm a huge music fan, always have been. Grew up in a home where music was tremendously important. Um, this is my good friend Brad Cook, who's a member of Megaphone. Um, incredible band, and this is our street party last year, and uh, a shot from, from behind him singing to the crowd. And beyond having a great time getting folks together, listening to incredible music, um, we chose to put together an event where all the profits that we raised could go to support something that this truly should be about, and that's community music school. So all those people that you see, it's one of the biggest day parties that happened last year. We brought together a group of folks, all these bands. Um, Mother Earth Brewing came on board and <clears throat> sold us everything at cost so that we ultimately sponsored that and ended up donating every dime that we raised, which as you can see, there's a lot of people drinking beers in that crowd, which is <laughs> always a good thing. So, um, <laughs> I'm praying this shit worked is what that says. <laughs> Maybe giggling a little bit back there. This is our pastry chef and a great time to introduce him, I think. Um, this is meant to talk about a few things. Um, as mentioned, we bring people into our community to cook. We get out and we cook in a lot of other communities. And that means that we're constantly working here and wanting to be there for the folks that we're cooking for here. And then we're going out and sharing the message of, of all these beautiful things that are raised and grown in the South and what's incredible about Southern cooking right now, which is something that people are really excited about and ultimately does things like brings people to this city and they come to a place like Contemporary Art Museum. You know, and I'm also on the board here and very proud of that. Um, and I think one of the things that's so incredible about this particular program is it feels a lot like pools in that it's not just about what's on the chalkboard or what's hanging on the walls, it's about the people standing in front of it. And the consideration and thoughtfulness of, of this program is all about that. So. Um, I'm, I'm very, very proud to be here today and very proud to be a part of this organization. Uh, but so there should be somewhere in here, who knows where, another note that has a, has, a, has a note from Andrew with the careful packing instructions for this. But uh, we thought it would be fun to take the extra ones and break them all up and send them to him as soon as we got there. So they're going to have like, because <laughs> he's still thankful, I can tell from the look on his face. <laughs> okay, I know what you're thinking. I, t I, I know, I'm sure there are a handful of vegetarians in the room. I want to tell you how much I respect your commitment. Um, and I understand because look how cute that little guy is. I mean, he's adorable. <laughs> but. Uh, the point of this slide is to say it's hard to think about eating really cute things. And, uh, but the importance of thinking about it is, is the fact that we need to understand where our food comes from. We need to understand and demand how it is treated, how it is raised, and, 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 and demand that it be done humanely so. And this is a fun way of approaching that subject. But, um, Obviously, I believe in the food chain. I've built a life on it. Um, but I also believe that uh, beyond the fact you've heard all the slogans about, you know, happy, happy pigs make delicious pigs. That's true. But also, it's the right thing to do. And it's something we should be thinking about and we should be asking questions about. And we should always be talking to the people who we thank and, and value for serving us food we should always ask more of them. You should always ask more of me, and for that, we become a better society. Uh, great, excellent. This is <laughs> the cocktail menu at Pools, and just uh, gives you an idea of sort of how those menus are shared if you haven't, if you haven't been in. Um, this is Beasley's, Chuck's, and Fox, and this is Someone laughed at me the other day when I called it our second project. I'm like, you really call that a project? <laughs> but it's how the only way we could think about it without thinking or recognizing that we were completely insane to do it <laughs> all at one time. So um, this was a really neat process and a really neat opportunity. And I've been living in Raleigh. I moved here the day after my 18th birthday to go to school at NC State. Um, 
I hadn't spent, whoo, hadn't spent any, I, I, I think it's, how's it go? I'm NC State educated, just not NC State graduated. <laughs> <laughs> um, all those C's, they went far. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but anyway, so I've been living here, uh, I'll be 37 in August, so for a few minutes I've been around these parts. And there used to be this great building in downtown Raleigh when I would walk around downtown Raleigh, and I don't know how many of you have been here for how long, but downtown used to be tumbleweeds. It was crazy. Like after five o'clock, you had no idea where you were. It was pretty, it was pretty, you felt like you were on a film set and, uh, and not in a good way. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting and there was, you could tell there had been something here before and that it was now missing and you, got, you felt that void which um, ultimately served us quite well and that it, it drove this community again to ask more, to demand more and, and I think we've been uh, satisfied on a, lo a lot of levels with, with that interest. But there was a building on the corner of Wilmington and, um, and Martin Streets, and it was called Jimmy's Market. And it was such an interesting place, and you could, you could I think it was still open at that time and probably closed down at you know, five o'clock like everything else did. And then for too long, it was gone, and it was just this empty space that sort of turned into a handful of different things. And I always, just one of those places I just always walked by and I always felt something, you know, and, and so much of everything that I do is simply based on feeling something and, and having an emotion and a, an attraction to something and have, needing to figure it out and figure out what it's supposed to be. But Jimmy's sat on this corner and, and corners are just, you know, as you know, so important for igniting new life on, on important streets and streets like Wilmington Street. They're full of such interesting culture and history. So years go by and uh, Pools has been open for about three years at this time. And I uh, am talking with my friend David Meeker who has stopped by the photo shop next door to buy, uh, to, to pick up some, something he just had framed. And it was, he has them in his hands and we're you know, just chatting and, and I look down, I'm like, is that Jimmy's? He's like, yeah, I bought it. You know, I bought it about a, a year ago. And I'm like, you bought that picture? He's like, no, I bought the building. <laughs> <laughs> because I really like one of those prints. Ultimately, I got one of those prints as well. But um, So we started, I'm like, God, that's such a cool thing. I love that building. We start talking about it. He's got this plan to like develop it into three spaces up top. His team might want to later do something like a brewery. I don't know, down the line. So uh, we get in these conversations and in about two weeks, we've decided, we've got sort of intent established. And, uh, and you know, a month down the line, we've got a lease handful of days, or the beginnings of a lease for a space of four, uh, which in two weeks, just scratching my head about it, and finally I wake up one morning after, I say wake up, after not sleeping, which is something I do a lot of. Um, and uh, we got together that day and worked out that I would take the whole building. And it was out of a, a love for this, this space and just knowing that I was gonna get in there and feel like I, I wanted to do more in that space recognizing how important that corner is for activating this beautiful street that's got, and if you've ever walked down that street, it's incredible. There are all these old pawn shops and menswear shops and just something that was of a time, you know, and just really important. And I love that a lot of, you know, some of it still exists and that we're taking buildings like this and trying to return them to some of their original, if only a bit of their original glory. So there were lots of different plans and thoughts for what we could do with this space. Um, there was a beautiful proposed dark wood storefront like we often see on beautiful old buildings. But this wasn't a dark wood storefront building. This was a grocery store and we wanted it to look like one. We wanted people to walk by uh, who maybe hadn't been there in 30 or 40 years and go still be, be, you know, even if their memory was challenged for this to be something that jogged their memory and reminded them like, I remember what used to be here. And hopefully with what we would do inside of these walls that we would continue to honor that not necessarily through a grocery offering, but serving people and, and, and serving them with things that are comforting. And so, hence uh, Beasley's. Um, some of you may know this story, I am Beasley. It's my mother's nickname for me, uh, which... Mrs. I, Beasley. Just Beasley, just. <laughs> so, it was, uh, a, as a child, when I would sort of have a temper tantrum, which children tend to do at times when they're acting like children, uh, my mother used to just laugh at me and she would say, you look just like a little old lady. You look just like Miss Beasley, who is a, a character from uh, 
Family Affair, which is a, a show of my earlier time, I guess. <laughs> but, um, and you know, I, I sort of hit an age where I was really comfortable celebrating the things that might have been embarrassing when I wasn't as comfortable with myself. So it's something that my mom, delights my mom, and uh, you know, it's of course to honor my mother's fried chicken. My father was a hobbyist beekeeper when I was a child, and we grew up eating a lot of chicken and honey. And we seldom meet anyone who walks, th you know, the thousands of people who come through there in a week's time, very few ask for no honey, which tells us that we've established a trust in our community, and we love that. Um, Chuck's, of course, is to honor the Chuck muscle from which the burgers are ground. And the liquor bar below is to honor my father, who is still with us, but enjoys having a bar named after him. It's called, uh, <laughs> it's called Fox. Um, it's close up. That's Andrew's first uh, note. <laughs> Please take care of these. Please. <laughs> That's Andrew. Hey. Uh, this is my friend Sam Jones, who owns and operates the best damn barbecue joint in North Carolina. It's called the Skylight Inn. Uh, we recently hosted an event here where uh, we showed a film honoring Sam and his family. and. Uh, it's been called the capital of barbecue. And so to celebrate, I believe it was by National Geographic, uh, that, that gave it the name. And uh, they celebrated the honor by actually placing the capital top on the building of the, the little tiny Skylight Inn. But uh, so Sam has a particular way that he cooks barbecue. And at this point, I, you know, I like for Sam to do it. I feel like uh, I really understand where he's coming from with this technique as I do that of uh, about five other pitmasters because I am on a pitmaster team with a group of uh, gentlemen from all over the South. And what's incredible about that is, of course, learning about how all these masters are doing something that we honor so much in North Carolina, um, how much we all come together and appreciate all these different, you know, used to be like you, people draw blood over saying who had the best barbecue, but. Uh, we all know that everybody does it differently, and, uh, and there's so much to learn from each other. And what's incredible, so uh, we're a group of folks that are come together, and we, we basically cook um, you know, philanthropy-based events in each other's cities, and we do it centered around the barbecue project. Um, and the gentleman who started it, uh, it was a chef and a barbecue chain owner, a guy named Nick Pahakis, who owns Jim and Nick's and Donald Link of the uh, Herb Saint and Koshan restaurant group in New Orleans, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. But they started by wanting to get this group of folks together to think about things, question things, figure out how to do things better, learn from each other. But they also wanted to start a, uh, a hog farm that would be um, sustainably raised, all natural, uh, just a really beautiful project. And of course, we cook those pigs. And additionally, the goal of that is to take this incredible pork and find a way to bring it to you know, all economic backgrounds, to be able to put this, raise this stuff right, get it in grocery stores so that families can raise their children on, you know, and, and, and afford to, uh, to purchase this. So, um, Stir the pot. This is uh, an event that uh, I started with a whole lot of help. Uh, it's definitely a we started in this community. Um, I'm very involved in Southern Foodways Alliance, which is a group that is dedicated to uh, documentary, doc documenting and celebrating Southern culture as it applies to food, beverage, and music, and all the things that spin off of that, which as we all know, tend to be pretty good things. Uh, there's an annual symposium. It's in Oxford, Mississippi. And the first year that I got to go, uh, I, it's about four days long, and I like to say that in those four days, I felt like I opened up to and learned more about my place in the South and the South itself that I had in four years. And, and it was really amazing, an incredible experience. And, and this, uh, again, catalyst of community, all these folks coming together from all over the place and teaching each other and, and, and learning. And, and just every, I, I believe that the theme was uh, the liquid South. So it was this great study of um, food and, and, and beverage and how they work together. I went to a, uh, a lecture on blues music and the consumption of canned heat, which is apparently quite delicious in Orange and Nehi. Uh, and there are a lot of blues songs written about it, and it's incredible, things like that that you just don't, don't recognize or think about. Um, all kinds of different you know, beverage expressions. Uh, the last 
the closing lecture is always something very powerful. And uh, so the, the final lecture was with um, Junior Johnson, who is our, our famed uh, moonshine uh, producer and, and runner, and uh, you know, part of a time where our, our fabulous NASCAR was, was created. So um, he had agreed to speak about his life, and they'd been trying to get him to do this for, for so long, but he didn't feel comfortable just standing up and talking to a group of complete strangers. But he agreed to sit with, uh, sit in an armchair next to another person in an armchair facing each other on a stage and to have this conversation in front of us. And to hear him speak of his craft and his culture and uh, without saying much about what it had contributed on such a high level to, to, our, to our communities uh, and, and to the South um, and beyond, uh, it, was in, it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. It's so much history, so much that people don't ever think about where it began. And, and this guy, you know, the, and it's one of those things, this guy's talking about moonshine and, and being, you know, like 12 years old and, and racing from cops and all the, all the things that, that have come from this and all the, all the people who were arrested and what he saw in his family. And the whole room is like in tears. And it was just one of those things where if, if you sat and you thought, I'm so glad that I, I didn't miss this. Um, also at that first uh, SFA symposium, I experienced uh, the incredible uh, leadership through food of Ann Quatrano, who owns uh, Bacchanalia in Atlanta, Star Provisions, handful of other restaurants. Um, she's kind of like at this point, I view her very much as the, the sort of the godmother of, of Southern cuisine. And uh, she's an amazing woman. She has such an interesting take on things, but she put down a lunch, and I'll explain why this is important. A few slides in, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, but uh, she made a meal that, as I sat among all these cooks who I know and these chefs and restaurant folks, uh, you know, we all sort of ate in silence for a few minutes because it was just so incredible, and it was the kind of food that makes you think and, and think about all these classic techniques and things that have belonged to the South forever and these fresh ways of approaching them. Um, this is a letter <laughs> that it comes in a series of letters for me. They are sometimes handwritten, and I think when she can't write as clearly as she wants to, she types. And her name is Ruth, and I've never met her, and she's my pen pal. <laughs> and she um, lives in like a, an assisted uh, you know, community in, in uh, Raleigh. So, uh, but she had the pleasure of knowing James Beard. And so upon our first semifinalist nomination, she wrote me this letter telling me that we'd never met, how she was proud of me, and such an interesting thing to hear from someone you've never met. And she often mentions in her letters uh, and, and everything that happened. So that one was uh, really still proud of you for the semifinalist and saw that you got the gold medal and the News and Observer. And it was kind of like this, don't worry about the fact that you didn't move on. This is great too, you know. <laughs> and um, very sweet. But uh, she always mentions in the end, um, when my niece comes, I'm going to get her. When my niece comes to get me, I can't drive. She's going to bring me to pools. And it's in my mind and in my heart that, of course, I could go get her and bring her to pools. <laughs> but somehow, we have this relationship that I'm kind of scared of changing. You know, and it's that part of me that still gets scared of things is kind of scared of disappointing her. <laughs> um, this is the mac and cheese. And this is our, uh, this is our mascot in the kitchen. It, it moves and talks. And uh, she's a vegetarian. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's her, her favorite thing on the menu. This is my favorite scene from my favorite movie. It has nothing to do with anything. I just want to share that with you guys. <laughs> This is the opposite of uh, what probably comes from really good pork. Yeah. But I'm so intrigued by, when we think about creative process, the guy who was like, damn it, I've got to make microwave pork rinds. <laughs> like, who here, who here doesn't want to talk to that guy? <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I did. Um, this is our, officially out of sequence, Probably, well, maybe our next project. I'm not, hopefully it'll be our next project. 
Um, it's called uh, Ox. It's going to be our commissary kitchen. And I wanted to tell you about this because uh, as we sort of grow as a restaurant team and uh, a, a group who wants to be very engaged with this community, we also want to be very engaged with each other. So as we grow, what we didn't want to get into was doing all these things in these different places and trying to figure out um, how, for me, how I could talk to the people who make it happen every day and truly engage with them in a way that isn't, okay, great, 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 I gotta go, I gotta go out to the other place. Uh, so we decided to create a place where we will take all of our prep teams, put them in one place where we can spend time together every day, that we can train everybody to the same level, and that the expectation is to do absolutely the best we could possibly do each day when we're cooking for this community, which we're so honored by that opportunity. So we're working on building a space we think we know where it is, but we don't think enough to promise that that's where it's going to be yet. So, um, so this is where we'll start to grow. This is where we come together and, and talk every day about what we want to commit to that day about food and how we want to teach each other something new each day. And additionally, as we look at all these incredible restaurant spaces and, or, or buildings in downtown that we might be able to express a restaurant space in, we want to think about the fact that we want you to experience as much of that building as possible. So to go in and keep building like big walk-ins and all this stuff that could technically be in another place and we can share more of the beauty of that building with you, then that's something we're, we're very interested in. Uh, the logo, like all of our logos and really the things that make us pretty are designed by Josh Gajownik, who's in the room today and just an unbelievable designer. and. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this because Josh and I came together when we started to work on the second project. Um, so we were designing not just three logos, but truly three identities, three different identities to make things, you know, for there to be things that were recognizable in each space that we feel like sort of say that we were there and also uh, speak of quality. And when you find something that's quality, you don't change it just so that it looks different. Uh, but we had to find a way to express all these interesting things, and so Josh was um, how that happened and, and, and made, it, made it possible for us. And also, um, you know, it was a really interesting process. I'd never had a designer before, you know, and to, to work together and, and to share something that, again, we then both would have ownership in, uh, and, and to build a relationship that's based on the creative process is a really neat opportunity. And so what we found now that after it was a really great experience, it was a really great process, and now we, we've started to work on new things. And it's amazing the speed that we move at because we know how to talk to each other. And we know, we know how to, you know, he can look at me and say, you liked that one, didn't you? I knew you were going to like that one. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I think for the first one that we did out of the gate after the second, uh, we made a decision. I was like, yep, that's it. I want that one. And Josh was like, what? <laughs> this took months last time. That can't be right. So amazing. And uh, if you have the opportunity to say hello to him before you leave today, he's uh, brilliant and we're, and we're proud to work with him. This is Sam, again, holding up uh, the, the thing that sort of defines him as a pit master, and that's that we all uh, often cook on expanded metal. If you know what expanded metal is, it's like a looks like a grate, and that's what you see on, a lot on pig cookers. But Sam designed this crazy pig cooker that's based on all of our pig cookers. It's amazing, absolutely gorgeous. But one of the things that it has is what his pits have, which is expanded metal, metal for like the belly side. And then for the back, they're just bars that are separated. And so what happens is, it seems like that wouldn't make much of a difference, but it turns the skin essentially into glass. And so it's, you can take it and shatter it, and it's, it's really amazing and very delicious. And so the thing that defines Sam's barbecue is what they do is they have these cutting boards. They're this thick. They start on one side and they, with two, with two uh, uh, knives. They chop, they chop the pork and they work the skin into it and they work in the whole. You, so when you eat whole hog at Sam's place, you truly eat whole hog because he works in all the, all the parts from the ham and the shoulders and the bellies and everything's there. And then he chops up all that skin and mixes it in too, and it's amazing. Um, and this is at a recent... Uh, a recent Frankie Lemon fundraiser uh, out in North Raleigh. This is um, one of the things that I am very excited and proud about. Uh, we did a, an event over Thanksgiving last year 
where we started thinking about all the space that we had in our, uh, in our three new shops. And it seemed, you know, we had all these tools to do big work. So we chose to feed 1,500 folks for Thanksgiving. And we had, uh, without asking, incredible folks who popped up and donated, a, a group donated all the turkeys, which, you know, to, we were prepared to absorb those costs, but it's so heartwarming to see people who want to be a part of those things. And this is from uh, a letter that was hand delivered the day after from uh, the men's shelter. Um, and they got them all who were there to come together that day and sign it. And to me, it was just an incredible, beautiful thing. And we're very, very proud to keep that as one of the things that will always be in our possession. Um, so this is, uh, I have a little puppy dog. So the reason I'm telling the story, I promise. So I have a little puppy dog who was recently hit by a car. And uh, she's great. She's doing great. She's healing up very nicely. This is her friend, Harper, who sent her this message. <laughs> um, she, it was what, she got flowers in the mail. She got all kinds of stuff. I, like, I, I like to say she got more than I would have gotten if I had been hit by a car. So, but she's healing beautifully. She's an incredible, incredible puppy. But the reason I, I share this with you is because people often ask me, what do you, are you just so busy? Like, do you ever get away for the things that you need to get away for? Do you, you know, how do you find time for your personal life? And I think um, if you have trouble making that time, your personal life finds, finds the time. So uh, I just want to assure you for all the crazy things we do, this week I spent at home and stayed for everything we had going on. I just want you to know that I recognize the things that are important at home and they're always, as much as I love you guys, the most important thing in my world. Uh, this is my burn barrel. This is how we make charcoal out of, out of hardwood and roast pigs and roast whatever we choose to cook. Uh, the potatoes laying in it um, will then be covered by, covered by those uh, coals that we've created. And this is to lead into telling you about a trip that I took. Uh, another thing that the Fatback Collective, which is the Pitmaster group's name, um, another thing that we're committed to is at least every couple of years coming together and taking an international trip where we can both teach something where we're going and that we can learn extensively together in, in another, you know, in, in an environment that we haven't visited before. So we went to um, Uruguay together uh, a December ago. And it was an incredible trip. And as you know, uh, a gentleman named Francis Malman has had quite an impression on, on uh, Uruguay. And uh, it's, he has a very interesting uh, sort of real estate investment there and in that he owns towns there it's it's uh, but but he also you know has taught this community how to take this style of fire cooking and make it what is what is telling of, of their story how they share their story uh, so we went and these guys cooked for us for a few days and we cooked for them and we all came home and we were different you know we were different in the way that we thought about this we were different in the way that we thought about what we actually need to do a job and you think about the simplicity of that and it makes you appreciate so much in, uh, makes you appreciate you know, just so much about everything that we have to work with but also you, could, you do such a better job expressing what you're trying to express when you get down to the bare bones of it and so this, this was that opportunity. This is me and Matt Fern uh, who I think many of you know. Uh, at w one of the um, great honors of our career, we were recently in New York uh, after making the finalist list for the James Beard Awards. Um, Matt is someone who I can't say enough about and I wish he was here right now. Uh, but uh, he is wearing a tie that is fashioned from an old pools t-shirt. <laughs> and he had all these surprises, you know, kind of laid out and that was one of them. And I think it's, it says something about, about him. And he's uh, the most committed and dedicated person I've, I've ever met. And, and that's, that feels like saying a lot. Um, this was my question today because I remember being a child and believing in everything and being scared of things in the right way and also just being a total dreamer, you know, and, and thinking about all the ways that my life might turn out and thinking about it constantly. And I think that like that kind of thinking and the fact that I grew up in a home where that was uh, embraced and celebrated is how I entered the world, believing that, you know, I can make anything happen that I, that I want to make happen. And, uh, and so I think it's an important question for everybody and something to remind ourselves of. Um, 
So mine today is uh, money is a detail, not an excuse. And I mention this because if I had had to have the money to do anything I've ever done, I would have never done any of it. And if, if it had seemed like more than I can do, I would have never done any of it, you know. But uh, a long time ago, you know, we, we, I sort of grew up in a family where we didn't have a lot and we appreciated everything that we had. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, and, but knowing that if you want something, you work for it. And, uh, and so I think in all those times when we were trying to figure out how to grow and how to make things happen, you know, people are always saying, but that's going to cost so much money. Well, but that's why we have relationships and that's why we have, and that's why we invest our time in, in, in our community and, and, and are able to turn around and give it something back is because none of this is about money. That's a, that's a currency of exchange. This is about committing to things, setting forth after a goal and just making it happen. This is uh, a drawing that you guys may recognize from uh, the board at Beasley's. It came in uh, maybe eight months after we opened Beasley's. Uh, you see the name Sack there. That is uh, recognizing Pete Sack, who drew this. And it's beautiful. Uh, I love it. But what I really love about it is he kept trying to contact me. And I was very busy at the time. And uh, he kept calling the restaurant. And I kept getting these messages. And finally, I'm like, what is this about? And it ends up, this guy wants to come in and draw on the chalkboards. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so. So it ends up that uh, we finally talk, and we're sitting, and I'm kind of waiting for him to explain this to me. And he says, well, you know, I'm just not a food guy. Like, it, it's just not my thing, and I, I understand I need, to, I, I need to eat to survive, but beyond that, it's not something I think about much. And I sat here, um, you know, however many months ago that I've been trying to get in touch with you, <laughs> and uh, I sat here, and I had this pork shoulder meatloaf that you guys make, and it just changed me, you know, and I, and I went home, and I... I went and visited my parents, and I was telling them about this experience, and I told them, I just feel different, and I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to do something to thank you. And if that's not like the most incredible showing of that currency of community, I think it's beautiful, and, and we uh, are still trying to figure out what you're supposed to do to chalk to make it never go away, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, this is a pulley. Uh, we have probably 16 of them that we've purchased one by one, just to give you sort of the sneak peek that this will be an element in Jewel, in our new coffee shop. Um, TNT crispy chicken livers. Uh, if you guys have spent any time in Nashville, Tennessee, I've spent quite a bit because some of my best friends in cooking live there. And again, we do a lot together and we work together a lot. Uh, and with Stir the Pot, which I mentioned before, uh, we started a second chapter because these guys were so amazing, so tuned in and, and so understanding of what we're trying to accomplish with that work. And let me back up and say the thing that I think I missed when we were discussing this earlier. Um, so stir the pot after describing all those beautiful things that I felt when being in Oxford, Mississippi and that great experience. Uh, there were a, a couple things that were going on here for me. I was experiencing a lot of success as a young person and I was excited about that, but I, I saw some you heard some things that, that people had said within the community about whether we deserved it or not, or why did we get all the attention. And to me, the answer is because we went out and did something that we loved and believed in, and we did it with all of our hearts, and we did it to do it. We didn't do it just to run a business or to make money. We did it because we loved it, and I think that people taste that, and I think that people feel that when, when they sit in those places. So. There was something that I wasn't, I didn't feel like annoyed by that. I just felt like that's got to change. If we're going to become a better community, that's got to change. We've got to find a way to change that. And so I wanted to start an event that, uh, where we weren't the headline, you know, where we, we could sit in the background and celebrate someone else from, from another community. So we started Stir the Pop with the format that we would invite a guest chef from the South and beyond with some connection to this understanding of Southern culture. And uh, that it would be all about celebrating that chef. So we hosted at Pools. We are the support team for the chef, but it is all about telling this chef's story, uh, them expressing their sense of place and learning something from each other, talking about you know, uh, agriculture and politics and all the things that, that we express in different ways in different communities. And, and so that's been tremendously successful. 
It's been a good, it's something we uh, donate all the proceeds to the documentary film initiative for Southern Foodways Alliance. But the goal I feel like very much has been met. And the second day of this is uh, what has been a community potluck in my home, which started to see about 100 people. So we recently had the pleasure of moving it to CAM and, uh, and, and therefore having the ability to show all the films that the funds that we're raising are supporting. Um, so TNT were uh, Tyler Brown and Tandy Wilson are uh, chefs in Nashville, Tennessee. And I invited them separately to come eventually, each of them, and they came together and said, we'd like to come together. We want to represent Nashville. And I loved that. And I thought it was so true to what, to what we're doing. Um, but uh, Nashville is known for Nashville hot chicken, which is also has been honored in a Joe York uh, Southern Foodways Alliance film. Um, but it's this beautiful thing. It's hot as hell. It's uh, fried, covered in, uh, hot flour and peppers in the oil and gen gen generally served on a piece of white bread with pickles. So this was our tribute uh, to the boys of the boys of Nashville, uh, Tyler and Tandy. And we often um, often have an exchange of honoring them, which is pretty fun and they do the same uh, do the same in their place. This is a uh, this is secret code at the Waffle House where um, I recently competed in a uh, something called the Waffle House Smackdown, which Mike Lotta took the title on. He lives next door to one. I didn't really think that was fair, but um, he eats there a lot. Uh, but uh, so what was interesting about this is it was this really funny event, and it was, you know, pretty fun publicity thing for Charleston Wine and Food. And they trained us in Waffle Houses in our own community. And everyone's sort of laughing about it, like, oh, you believe we get to do this? And I was like, like, if you want to talk about a business based on, like, great design and planning, everything is, like, unbelievable there and if you ever if you ever been in a Waffle House and you watch them call an order nobody writes anything you know they don't write anything down everything is like that's how they write it down it's all these plate markings and it's incredible and uh, inspiring design for me this is um, a uh, basically like an oyster roast and again just a really beautiful element of design that's at Palmetto Bluffs in uh, Bluffton South Carolina uh, this is a painting by one of my favorite painters and one of my favorite people, Luke Buchanan. Um, it is, uh, you know, Fox has been open for almost two years. My father is a workaholic who refuses to take the time to come down here because he says, you know, like, Dad, it's a one-hour flight. You could do it in a day and a half. He's like, yeah, but if I come, I want to drive. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so maybe he'll get here. But for his birthday last year, uh, Luke did a painting that was sort of a slice of the building, and so that is in my father's living room, so he's kind of been to Fox. But uh, <laughs> this is a um, receipt from Le Comptoir in Paris. Uh, this is, I think, was our favorite meal. Um, there were four of us, which should be terrifying to you that four people ate that, um, and we did, I think we ate it all. Uh, but incredible, incredible, um, incredible meal because of all these classic dishes that are served over and over again in all these places, this was a place that had these really interesting, fresh takes on, on these very traditional foods. And that's something that we consider to be inspiring and certainly how we would like to be classified. This is a building you may have seen in uh, downtown Raleigh. It sits next to Father and Son. It's actually two buildings. Uh, it is on the corner of uh, Hargett and Salisbury Streets, and it is uh, the next corner that we would like to make a difference on a street with. Uh, it is owned by James Goodnight Jr., who is a huge supporter of our restaurants and has become a really neat friend in this process of learning how to, again, you know, cultivating this relationship of how to honor something together. So this building is incredible. It has been uh, a funeral home and a bank and uh, several versions of banks, I think. Our um, concept on the first floor will be called Death and Taxes to honor those original uses uh, and the inevitable. Um, so, and then it's gonna be a wood fire oven concept where we roast, roast meats and seafood and vegetables and we do this, take this simple technique and celebrate great southern ingredients. Uh, floors two and three will be home to our first event space, and our last, most likely, uh, <laughs> event space. It's uh, a corner. You can see how giant the windows are. It's a gorgeous space. It has, we plan to do very little to it based on just how incredible it feels right now. Uh, 
Second floor is like 13 foot ceilings with 11 foot windows. We plan to style it out to feel like a beautiful downtown apartment as opposed to creating a space that just feels borrowed. You know? So we want to do something where people feel at home and to find a way to really engage them with that space and celebrate them through that space. So uh, gorgeous building. We're very, very excited for that project. This is Matt McCon from Superchunk who I was so terrified to speak after. <laughs> I came to this last time and I'm like, Max, do it? Oh, God. So, but I, I bring Mac up because uh, he, uh, over the last several years, has become a friend, incredible guy, very important person, contributing a lot to this area. But um, when I was like 18 years old, I was seeing Super Chunk shows as often as I possibly could and, uh, and, and going out and celebrating live music and loving it. Still love to when I can. It becomes uh, increasingly difficult. But at the time, I was... Um, also a, a, an intern for a, a large music label. And uh, I thought that I wanted to be in the music business. And I saw a lot about sort of the underbelly of all that and why I didn't want to be in the music business. Um, which I think for, for Mac, obviously what he's done is to do that differently and to do something really beautiful. But at the time for me to choose and to learn about what's important to enjoy about things you love, and then how there are other things that you love and you want to be actively a part of. This is a beer and a koozie at Robert's Western World in Nashville, Tennessee. Again, just because. Um, <laughs> Grand Plateau, this is, uh, let's see. This is, I don't know if you can see that guy. <laughs> this is that guy's restaurant. This is Matthew Kelly. Um, I asked him, I asked his permission yesterday to use this photo. And he didn't respond. I was like, hey, man, I need to know. And they, and they responded by sending me another half-naked photo of himself. <laughs> that, 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 that then said, in, in parentheses, that's a yes. So this is us in Paris, night one, uh, drinking wine. We rented this beautiful apartment. We're just sitting around drinking wine, talking about the world, and uh, you know, talking about this wonderful trip that we're all on together. And I, I bring up Matt because um, he's one of my heroes. He's an incredible chef. He's an incredible part of this community that's made up at a minimum of these three cities. Um, and he's taught me so much. And he's been one of my favorite, favorite chefs forever, and he's one of my best friends. Um, but for me and for the things that I, when I started getting out there and doing things in other places, it was before I could afford to. It was before I could take help with me, before I had enough people in my restaurant to take anyone. It was hard enough to get out myself. And so Matt, who's consulting on multiple restaurants, he's the chef and partner at Vin Rouge. This is before he's up in Mateo. He, I would call him and he would just come with me. And he would like be my sous chef at all these gigs. And we'd have a great time. And I would always learn so much from working next to him. But he made these things that I felt like I really wanted to do and needed to be enriched by as someone who hasn't been to culinary school, you know, who wanted to get out and really have all these experiences. He made that possible for me. And, and uh, I thank him for that. This it just happens to be, I always accidentally take these screenshots, and I thought it was really funny that this was me and Jay, our director of service back there, talking on the way here last time. Just random. Um, this is to tell you that it's really fun to work in the kitchen. This is our friend, uh, our friend Thomas, who uh, has moved on to McCready's in Charleston. He's a great guy and was a, a cook with us for a little over a year, um, and come, comes back and visits and is someone who we hope to have the opportunity to work with again. But I, I put up this silly photo because um, it's a big part of what we do. We, we go after every day doing something that we love and, and enjoying it. And I think that's really important. And again, I think it's one of those things that you can taste. I think it's one of those things that you can feel when people go to work every day. Obviously, this is a little embellished, but uh, and, and, and truly enjoy what they do. Um, can also be painful, right? Uh, this is my friend Joseph Lynn, who uh, is this year's winner for the James Beard Award, Best Chef Southeast, who I was beyond proud to be nominated with. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I was a semifinalist for three years and made it to the finalist list this year. And I was there with some of my best friends. And it was just an incredible experience. So Tandy, who I mentioned from Nashville, Joseph Lynn from Blackberry Farm in Tennessee, um, Edward Lee, who I'll be introducing next week at Farrington, or a couple weeks, Farrington. Um, and Stephen Satterfield, who just cooked with us and was just here. So it was a really incredible place for all of us to be together and something really neat to celebrate in our lives together. Uh, this, however, <laughs> our friend Rick Flair, who you saw in our, our first, first shot there, uh, 
There's something that if you follow us on Twitter, you'll occasionally see a photo of Ric Flair or a woo circulated in celebration <laughs> between all these Southern chefs. And it's a really funny thing that we all grew up at a time where I'm from just outside of Greensboro, a small town called Kernersville. And like, that was like the coolest thing that Greensboro had going on at the time was like, WWF. And so the nature boy being a representative of that. Uh, but my good friend, Sean Brock, Ric Flair, I can't believe I don't have a tattoo of Ric Flair yet, but uh, he was being celebrated and honored at Blackberry Farm. And we went uh, in, into this presentation and there was a wrestling rink and a giant screen TV and they showed this video of Ric Flair. And then Ric Flair walked out. <laughs> and then all these guys got on stage and beat the hell out of each other with sheet pans. And Joseph was <laughs> just, just such a good sport. Um, these are our beehives that uh, just went onto the property of Eliza Craft Olander, who is my partner in philanthropy. Uh, one of my dearest friends and a total inspiration in how to lead a community to be a part of giving and, and, and giving beyond the level of comfort because it makes us think about things differently when we do that. Um, these are some ramps. They're being served at pools right now. This is the logo of, uh, that Josh has designed. Um, we like to do things that are real and uh, we whenever given the chance, choose not to do something that pretends to be something else. And this is, uh, Josh found this incredible resource, a guy who does the detailing on the, on the back of boats, and he's, uh, you know, does, um, does gold leafing. Uh, we decided that the metal that we wanted to identify with for Jewel is copper, because it's a, it's a working metal. And, and uh, so this is actual true copper leaf. You've seen that guy. I think you've seen that guy. <laughs> He's got a lot of shot glasses and a bottle of Fernet, which uh, we call Sex Panther out of that favorite scene <laughs> from, that you saw earlier. Um, but it seems to be this thing that uh, is shared in, in the restaurant industry, it's sort of adult Jägermeister. It's delicious. Um, this, is an invite. Um, this is an invite to our five-year anniversary. Uh, we, m we made it to five years, which we were so excited about. We wanted to share that by thanking our, our community of close friends who had made a lot of that possible for us. Um, and, and lots of good folks were a part of that. We picked our, our favorite dive bar, Slim's, to, uh, to honor the occasion with. And uh, that day, Matt Fern became a partner at Pool's Diner. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. It's um, a Sharpie, the word Paris. It's the text message I sent Matt when I decided that 10 of us should go to Paris <laughs> to think about uh, not just to be in Paris, but to think about eating the way that folks think about eating in Paris. Um, Beasley's you've seen. This is another proud moment for me. This is a handwritten letter from Michelle Obama after I was um, quite honored by having the opportunity to introduce her at a fundraiser, and she's an extraordinary woman. Uh, this is a sign from a city that I think is a really wonderful food town. And I love what they do, and I love how over the top they do all the things that they do. But I love the way that we do what we do here, too. And I appreciate that sort of their differences from, from afar. And I have so many friends that have moved there and live there and love it. And I'm so blown away every time I'm there. But it reminds me of how much I enjoy our pace here. This is my godson. This is Asa. This is a. Um, these are notes on a dish. That little guy is the tuna <laughs> for the, um, the Niswa. I'm considering doing the illustrations for the book I'm working on. I wanted to see what you guys thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I remember where I park when I'm traveling a lot. This is, uh, this is Bill Murray. <laughs> I follow him on Twitter. And uh, I wanted to just sort of intro, intro the idea of Twitter. and. Uh, He's one of my favorite people that I follow, and um, it's, it's really interesting stuff that he writes. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk about, you know, as, as it is the platform for sharing um, sort of a view of what happens in this room. I think it's a really incredible uh, means of communication. And um, for me, as someone who thinks in small blurbs, it's never challenging to get it in those, that many characters for some reason. Um, but the thing that I want to point out that I love about it, and it's not true of everybody who participates, but I love how positive it generally is. And there are so many formats where people get to make up who they are. Um, comments on blogs, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand us taking the time to, to read things where people aren't 
representing truly who they are. And I think when there's not that ownership of, of what you have to say, I feel like generally if you ever look at a blog and it starts with a statement, by comment three it has nothing to do with what the statement is. And I just feel like all of our time should be spent doing, doing things that make us, as much of our time as possible, that make us better. And, and to thinking positively, I feel like Twitter is, again, a great catalyst for that on, on so many levels. Oysters, because I love them. Um, we've seen that guy. OK, he's a repeat. I uh, am a big fan of all kitchen tools and the way that people think about, I've got the next big idea. And I'm the first one to buy things and try them out. And this is uh, this thing that you put in an avocado and you spin it and it takes all the meat out of the avocado. It works quite well, but it also makes an excellent catcher's mask for Riley. <laughs> I think we might be, oh, here we go. Um, this is, uh, we talked about that Southern Foodways Alliance lunch that meant so much. Um, I had the honor of cooking this lunch last year, which was something that was on my list of things that I hoped in 10 years I might be invited to do. And uh, it was, the theme of the symposium was return to barbecue. And we chose to uh, make a lunch that honored barbecue for all of its supporting traditions. And so we made a 12 course all vegetable lunch at a barbecue symposium. Nobody noticed that there wasn't meat. And, and that was an amazing, one of, one of our most amazing accomplishments, we felt. Um, this is the logo for our new restaurant. Uh, Josh, of course, designed this. And it's, it's really neat. There are a lot of elements that are important. Um, but the detail there comes from a logo inside of the original vault safe door that's in the basement of the building. This is Luke Buchanan. This is a tattoo that he has right here on his chest. It reads, life is rich and full. Uh, I also have this same tattoo drawn by him. And we went out and got them to uh, honor a guest of ours who passed away. This is a whole steer <laughs> cooked by the Fatback Collective to support, to support a, um, a teaching garden in Birmingham, Alabama, in a really interesting neighborhood there. And, uh, this whole thing was fabricated and to uh, just to cook this whole steer. It was an amazing, amazing fundraiser and something that a bunch of people with all these different experiences, how cool is it to get 20 people together who've spent their life cooking and to do something together that none of you have ever done. So the conversation was incredible. This one still makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> so. We'll, we'll enjoy poking fun at this one because of talking about something that's become an interesting and really important thing, and that's like, what the hell is food television? What is that? And what was it? And what does it become? And is it important? And you know, of course, being a cook, people ask me all the time, like, do you watch Food Network? And I, I mean, I don't, but I don't have a lot of time either. I'm not saying I wouldn't. It'd be probably pretty fun to lay around and you know, watch some of the stuff that comes on there. But uh, the thing that's important about it is. It's made cooking cool. It's made restaurants, it's, ma it's made the chef sort of this new interesting idol which still kind of is baffling <laughs> except for the reason that that's so important and it's because the chef is this connection to all these really important things that happen in the community. And the thing that I feel like happened is that through this idea that, you know, cooking is cool, people wanted to know more about it. So they started asking more questions and the more questions that people ask, the more opportunity we have to tell these stories of all these incredible farmers and, and fishermen and oyster taggers and all these interesting guys who do all this stuff that's so important for people to think about, to understand that when they spend money in restaurants, you're not just paying a restaurant for something, you're supporting a system, you're supporting these families who make up all these important offerings that we have to have, not just to stimulate ourselves create, creatively, but to provide the right food for for people to eat. So in all of that, I think that people have wanted to know more. They've become smarter. They've become you know, more demanding about what they expect out of the food they eat, rather that was accidental or not, I don't know. But it doesn't matter because it's made the farmer, ultimately it's made the farmer more important. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to thank you guys so much for allowing us to be here with you. 
Um, and to mention that earlier we blew a fuse, so we were a little behind on coffee. We promised to be faster. But um, we know, I know that it was delicious. Anna uh, Yatevsky has just moved here from New York to run Jewel. She's incredible, incredible woman. I can't wait for you to meet her if you have a moment to talk with her today. Uh, we're very excited about That's our next project. We're very, very close. You know, it becomes the closer you get, harder to say how close you are. But um, we're really excited about sharing that project and not just bringing some new things to the table, but what we feel is very important, complementing all of the great shops that are already out there and being, being a part of that community. So uh, I want to thank Andrew, who, as I mentioned, is the pastry chef, who deals with a lot, <laughs> as you saw. Um, <laughs> And uh, again, I want to thank Tipperary Art Museum and, and thank Matt so much for having me. I know that he has some news for you regarding upcoming, uh, upcoming events. And uh, thank you again for having me. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. And, and so I know it's a little bit over time, but I think everyone's really enjoyed this. And so if you do need to leave, that's totally cool. But, um, but I think while she's here, like some of the best parts of this is just a kind of very casual back and forth Q&A. And so if people do have questions, let's jump into that. If people need to leave, they need to leave, and that's... Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about your engagement with philanthropy and what that means to you? Sure. Um, it's a great question, I, and I appreciate that question. Um, I talk about it often, and I'm excited that you want to know more about it. Uh, I was so blown away the first time that I did something in this community where I asked something of the community with how people responded. And, and it made me realize uh, what a, thank you guys so much, appreciate it. What, a, what a, an important point of influence to the community the restaurant is. And again, for all those things we talked about of what, how things should be done, what we should ask of ourselves, uh, I was really warmed by how the community responded. And it was, it was about 10 years ago and it was for an AIDS ride. And uh, I said, I was 26 years old and I set a goal of raising $26,000 and I raised $52,000 because of how people just were like, this is great, I wanna be a part of this. And so I walked away from that just feeling like, A, that felt amazing. Um, it just made what I do so much more important than just cooking every day. Uh, and, and it just became something that became very addictive for me in a, in a, in a good way. I, uh, my friend Eliza Kraft Olander, who I mentioned, uh, used to ask me to do, you know, to contribute something for trying a wine experience every year. And then at some point we did a dinner together and it just continued to blow my mind at how people would respond to things that we put together. And so we auctioned an item and it was literally like a dinner for, I don't know, 16 people and it auctioned for like $30,000. And I, that's when I realized it, it had become very serious. <laughs> and so at this point, um, you know, we spend, uh, you know, easily, for me, my personal time, easily 40% of my time just working on things that are philanthropy-driven projects. It's become ultimately how I would like to spend my life. And I, and I love this business and I want to continue to, you know, to, to build a business that provides as much opportunity as possible for the folks that work within our restaurants and to have them not experience a ceiling. Um, but at some point, I will ultimately, through the restaurants, 100% of my time will be dedicated to that. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of your creative process? So it sounds like um, you draw a lot of inspiration from the building that you're going mm -hmm. to occupy. What, yeah. what other, where else do you sort of get your, and, and, and also the other point being is that you have very diverse <coughs> concepts going on in your, in your different restaurants. Sure. So can you talk a little bit about how all of that comes about? Yeah, I think some of it is, as I mentioned before, kind of walking into a space and having a feeling, you know, and and also knowing the community and those particular streets and something that makes sense to me and that I feel, we often say this, that there are things, like for me, there are things running around in my head that I feel like are important to happen in Raleigh. And if somebody else did it, I would be fine. <laughs> but I hit a point where I'm like, all right, no one's done it yet, let's do it. So uh, some of it comes from that. And I, I also am, uh, you know, wanna be very clear and admit that one of my, I don't know if it's a fault or not, I'm not good with like, draw a building, tell us what you want to do in it. I need something to feed off of, you know? And so I think that we have found great spaces that make that easy, you know? And it takes a second and we just trust that it sort of will start to unfold and it does. And, uh, and that's where we feel like it's right, you know, feeling like 
this is what is supposed to happen here because it just sort of unfolds for us very naturally. Um, and then also, you know, just current issues and what's, what's going on in food and things that need to be brought to the forefront a little bit more. So like with this project, Death and Taxes is a very small space. Um, it gives us the opportunity to really work with some smaller farmers who, you know, we can highlight certain ingredients. There are some great programs out there right now that are doing great rotations with different growers who grow small amounts and getting that stuff in front of folks. And, and we see that to be something that we'd really like to be focused on in that environment. Hey, Ashley, how much time, if any, are you able to get back behind in the kitchen, whether it be pools, Beasley's, sure. and also at the new spaces? And is it difficult? Because how does that flow when you get into it if you, in fact, have to Yeah, I mean, service? obviously, in seven day a week scenarios becomes very difficult to be everywhere all the time. Uh, I don't cook at Beasley's or Chuck's. Um, they're, they're designed to be a little bit more concept driven and, and run by the people. And, uh, and that's been a really great thing for us there. When we get to developing new things when it comes to new dishes, I instigate that. And we have a, a development team there who work through the details and we'll taste through it and we'll establish those recipes. But I don't physically cook on that line. Um, at pools, I generally will expo. I, it's my favorite place to be. It is home. I am at pools diner for a reason. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean that that one's more special than any of the other ones, but it's, it's just the place that makes me feel the most at home and centered and creative. Yes? Can you speak a little bit more about your relationship with bees and obviously the obvious implications socially, but just sort of what is special to you about it? Sure, well, um, you know, obviously they're very important for a number of reasons. Uh, for me, with that connection with my father, uh, we grew up eating very healthy, eating very well. My dad was a big organic gardener as well, and I always like to tell the story that, you know, when I was a kid, he had a blender in the garage where he would collect bugs and make organic pesticide. And my friends would come over and be like, what is, what's up with that? <laughs> that was unheard of. So, um, but he was a beekeeper, and that was, that was where we experienced, you know, so at that time, you know, the, the palate-related sweetness of life. So, um, and, and, you know, they're, they're the importance of, of supporting that, that, uh, that culture is very important, I think, to all of us. But for me, it, it's this um, specific uh, memory-driven experience that is just sort of ingrained in me. But additionally, I think it's such an interesting um, expression of terroir, so to speak, because of the specific places where these bees are pollinating. And we use um, a honey at Beasley's that we buy all of from uh, Barry at Be Blessed at the Farmer's Market. If you guys, uh, we always introduce him as our beekeeper and he says, I'm a crop pollinator, <laughs> which I think is great. But um, it's, a, it's a honey called Galberry and it is a uh, kind of like a holly plant driven honey. It's rich and it's ambery, but not, not too dark and molassesy. It's, it's amazing. And so it's such an interesting honey in that they're, you know, honey like coffee is not a flavor. It's, it's something that expresses the place that it comes from. And so that's, that's one of my favorite things about it. Yes, sir. It sounds like one of the big themes is that you're passionate about your work and your customers are passionate about, about what you're doing question about, uh, you know, with businesses where customers usually aren't as passionate about things. Right. Uh, any thoughts on how to apply, to apply that there? Well, we start with the fact that we never refer to them as customers, they're guests. And I think when you remove that idea that it's just a monetary transaction, it starts there. And, and then from there, you always think about the experience. And, and, you know, I think when I was younger, I listened less. I do a lot more listening these days, and it, it serves serves me very well. Um, I learned so much from listening to our guests who have great ideas and great thoughts. And it doesn't mean that someone's going to come in and just say, I don't think you should do this, but things to consider, you know, and I think the more that you listen, the sweeter the tone gets too, which is really nice. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's relationship driven. Um, it's always a little challenging when you open the doors and people write about it, a bunch of people are going to come, they're going to check it out and they're going to have in mind what it's supposed to be. And then it's going to be a little different than they thought it was going to be. And so you're always up against that a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, one thing I think we're learning from Josh, um, that one of our best approaches is to do a little storytelling in advance and, and to help people to go into the experience a little bit more prepared. And uh, I, I think that's, that's a big piece of it is that everybody, you know, they don't want to necessarily just know what to expect, but they want to feel like they know what to do. 
when they get there. And I think that's, that's part of that, solving that challenge. But I agree that it's a big challenge, but it's, it starts, you know, absolutely starts with us and, and, and the body language and how, how we talk to each other and how, how we, if we're enjoying ourselves, how we make sure that that's clear. Yes, sir. Could you speak a little bit about your goals for the next six years? <laughs> <laughs> Not enough so far? <laughs> you mentioned the, uh, yeah, speaking, yeah. you mentioned a 10-year goal. I would love to. I would love to. Um, early on, so I was interested to hear so, about So that. The, the, upcoming, um, the upcoming projects that we're, we're doing uh, will, will keep us very busy for the next couple of years for sure. Um, I, my goal is to be open to, to doing things that are outside of my general way of thinking. And so one of the things that I think has become sort of a new, a new detail in, in, in my skill set is to recognize the skills in others. And that I don't want to, you know, and you ask the question, are you in all these behind the stoves at these places or when do you get, you know, and it becomes less about that and more about enjoying, you know, being a little bit more of a guiding hand and being able to have um, a much greater uh, and important impact on the community by doing so. And the other thing that's really important to us at this point as we do new projects is to build partners in. You know, to, if, if you want people to treat something like it belongs to them, well, let them have some of it. You know, they're, they're such an important part of things. So we look, we look now for, for new projects, for leaders within those projects who we don't just expect them to own it, act like they own it, we want them to own it. So that's, that's, a, that's a, the biggest goal, I think, for the next six years. And perhaps there are a couple more, there might be a couple more um, things that we have swimming around our head. I might not totally know the answer to that yet, but uh, I do, as we look at things like our auxiliary kitchen project, the thing that we're really thinking about now is how do we make that something more than just what we need? How do we if we have the space, how do we put a community element in there too that allows people to be a part of you know this thing and have access to something that might might be helpful and might contribute something greater than than what we need from it? Yes. If you don't use profanity, you won't offend anyone. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, so this was after purchasing the lease for pools. Uh, we were digging through and finding all these different things that were buried in different places in the restaurant and it took us about a year to we got sort of thrown into the permitting process thinking thinking it was going to be a turnkey uh, so it took us a year to open it which was a scary year but um, in that year we got to have a lot of really great conversations with folks who were anticipating the return of this um, this event that is pools so uh, and its place its historic time in, in, in Raleigh um, and something that people kept saying was, you know, a handful of folks who'd been around for a long time, there used to be this sign by the register, and it said the craziest thing. It said, if, if you don't use profanity, will it not offend anyone? And so we found that sign in the space. It just felt like it was so interesting what it said, and, and who knows where it came from. And I've asked the owners of the building, and they don't know. Um, but it, it struck people and they remembered it and it helped them sort of to anticipate what might be next for that space. And so we celebrated that by putting it on the back wall and it is also, we, it's painted on the back wall and it, it, the original piece lives in the diner as well. Anything else? All right. Okay, well thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>